I have been a minister for over 35 years now, and this is the first time that I have ever got the chance to enjoy a Minister's Appreciation Day. And on behalf of all the elders who attend here, I thank you very much. It means a great deal, frankly, to all of us to know that you appreciate us. It also makes it hard to give a topical and timely sermon on the subject without being self-serving. In fact, it's always hard to talk about ministry without being self-serving. But it is the time to talk about it since this is Minister Appreciation Day. Let me say at the outset that there are good ministers and there are bad ministers. It has been so down through time. But before you can know which is which, you've really got to understand what the word means, what a minister is, and what might one might expect or not expect from a minister, and what a minister might even expect from you. In biblical terms, a minister is a servant. That is all the word means. But in practical terms, in Greek as well as in English, the word in Greek, of course, diakonos, which is the word from which we get the word deacon, oddly enough, in Greek and in English, the word minister has a, uh, an official sound to it or an official connection, a connotation, and in fact even a denotation of an official office. It is a point, of, uh, an appointment to a role of a minister. It happens in government, for example. Uh, they, the uh, members of the cabinet in England are not called secretaries. They are called ministers. And that's why the prime minister is called prime minister. He is the first minister. He is first among equals, and uh, he is the leader of the country in that sense. But he is a, the first servant of the country. And we refer to our elected officials as public servants, although I would have to say sometimes it's, it's hard to tell that they really think that way, uh, but hopefully that uh, most of them do. There is a general service or ministry that exists. In other words, there is a ministry of setting up the tables in the back with refreshments after services because that is a service performed by people for this church, and therefore it is, by definition, ministry in that, in that way. But there is also dedicated service. Now, the word dedicated is an interesting word. We, we use it commonly in our language, but I don't know how often we really contemplate what it means in relation to us as individuals. Dedicated basically means wholly committed to a cause, an ideal, or a personal goal. It also means set apart for a specific use or purpose. Does that sound familiar to you? Set apart for a specific use or purpose. Now, if you're looking for a word, a Greek word, or a word from the Bible that might equate with that, what do you suppose that word might be? There is one. You don't find the word dedication a lot in the Bible, but you do find this definition a lot in the Bible to a different word. Dedicated is used, for example, of a computer as designed for specific use or exclusive application as a dedicated word processor, of a part or a component designed to interconnect exclusively with one, mo one model. Now, whenever we, uh, I remember putting in one of the big computers we put in once upon a time at the office, we had to have a dedicated line, that is a dedicated electrical line put into the building. A dedicated line means that this line that comes in, this one electrical line, is dedicated to this one purpose and it may run this machine and this machine only. You can't plug vacuum cleaners into it, you can't hook it up to the air conditioning. Anything that goes on and off or causes current or voltage to vary, some highly sensitive pieces of equipment just can't handle it. And therefore, you, put, you are required for this item to put in a dedicated line. Now, this is the word that we sometimes apply to people when we say they are dedicated. The dictionary actually looked at the synonyms devote, and dedicate, and consecrate, saying that they all share the same idea of assigning or committing someone or something to a particular activity or function or end. Devote is the most general of these terms, although it carries overtones of religious commitment. He has a great deal of devotion, or he is devoted. Uh, dedicate implies a more solemn or noble purpose and carries an ethical or moral term, tone along with it. We are dedicated to the achievement of this or that ac accomplishment. Consecrate, even when you use it in non-religious texts, implies an intense and sacred commitment, consecrated to the service of humanity. And that word consecrate you often do find in the Bible. The idea being of a very high commitment and calling and of dedication 
to a, a sacred commitment, as it were. Now, what was interesting to me in this, I went through all of this, and I looked up the word committed, and the meaning that really attaches to this in this sense is this. It means to bind or obligate as by pledge or assurance. Now, I told you that the word, this concept, is found very commonly. In fact, it is probably one of the most common words in the Bible, but it is not often translated in any of this terminology. In the Bible, the word is holy. It means set apart for common use. It's like a dedicated line, as it were. It is for one purpose and for one purpose only, set apart. At the beginning of this service, we had the laying on of hands and the blessing of, of, of a child. This child is set apart for God, dedicated to God. It is, in a sense, and it becomes, in a sense, a saint, because all the word saint means is holy one. And so whenever Paul speaks of a man and a woman staying together so that their children would be holy, he is admitting that children are among and numbered among the saints of God. And so that being the case, then there is this tremendous obligation to these children to teach them, to train them. They are actually princes of a royal family. They are, you know, called of God, set apart for God. They belong to God. And I think that our Sabbath school program, pro programs, the youth ministry and all aspects of it, and the work that we do to, for one thing, to make children aware of that, that they are set apart for God, that they are holy, that they are dedicated to Him, that they belong to Him, and that He takes a special interest in This is one of the obligations that we have as family members and as a church, is to be sure that our children understand their relationship with God. That they are not outsiders, that they are not, well, we use the term, well, the children are unconverted anyway. Well, conversion is one thing, but they are saints in a biblical sense. They are holy to God and should be treated as such, not as non-persons that can be brushed aside or ignored uh, or sort of uh, kept busy and out of our hair for a little period of time. We have a higher obligation to our children than that. The idea, as I said in the Bible, is holy. And the idea, of course, is that of dedicated. Now, it's true that a minister is a man specially dedicated or set apart. Those of us who are in the ministry in one form or another, who are elders or even deacons or whatever it is that we are, we actually are formally committed, formally dedicated by the laying on of hands. What this means is that we are bound and obligated to the service of God's people. Remember those words in the definition of committed? Bound and obligated. The laying on of hands binds us. You know, it's not a, not a question of having a freedom to, to do as you please. We are bound. We are obligated to the service of God's people. Choices that might have been available to us are no longer an option once we have been bound and obligated to God's people. There's a poignant moment between Jesus and Peter. You remember that Peter was told by Christ, he got rather rather boastful about himself and, you know, declaiming what he would and would not do, and Jesus said, oh, yes, you know, before the cock shall crow three times, or twice, you shall have denied me three times. And so, indeed, Peter did, and Peter was totally humiliated, went out and wept bitterly over what he had done. Well, when he and Jesus were together after the resurrection, we were together alone, walking along the seashore. When they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me more than these? And a lot of discussion has been given to what these are, and it really doesn't matter. The operative part of this question is, do you love me more than whatever, you name it? Do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. He said to him the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? I have a vision of this taking place over time. Not just bang, 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 but with little digressions in the conversation, discussions, or moments of silence as they walk together, and the question being asked again, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Now, 
very familiar to every parent and every child is this little expression. How often do I have to tell you? Right? How often do I have to tell you? We ought to have an abbreviation for it. We use it so often here so much in families. Well, Jesus three successive times bound Peter, obligated Peter to a task and to a mission that he expected him to do. Jesus dedicated Peter. Now, we often speak of dedicating ourselves or being a dedicated person and so forth, and I don't think oftentimes necessarily think, realize, or, or grasp the fact that Jesus or the Father have the power to dedicate you whether you like it or whether you don't. That dedication is not an option. It's an obligation, a binding obligation. And Peter was pretty well obligated by the time this got through. And clearly I say unto you, when you were young, you girded yourselves and you went where you wanted to. Put on whatever clothes you had in mind, went wherever you had in mind. When you shall be old, you shall stretch forth your hands and another shall gird you and carry you where you don't want to go. Thus spoke he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he spoke in this, he said to him, follow me. But I think in this thing that he told Peter is implicit, you are dedicated. You are now obligated and bound to a particular purpose. You are bound to a destiny. You are bound even to a certain kind of death. Your life isn't your own any longer. You belong to me. And you will do it this way. The analogy of when we were kids... We wore whatever kind of baggy pants and baggy sweaters or tight pants and tight sweaters we had in mind, and we didn't wear went where we wanted to on Saturday night or Friday night or whenever we were going to run around or carouse. It's over. That option of just doing as you please and doing what you want, he said, is an end. The time has come now when you have got to take other things into consideration. And when he had said to this, he said, follow me. You, follow me. And Peter, turning about, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, whom I presume was John following. And he also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, who is he that betrays you? It was John. And Peter, seeing him, says to Jesus, Lord, what about him? And this is one of the most classic responses that human beings have got. Whenever we feel the heat, whenever the pressure is on, we will inevitably try to deflect attention or thought or objection, or concentration somewhere else. I mean, the inten you imagine the intensity of being eye to eye, face to face with Jesus, and he's talking to you about you and what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. And his voice is intense and his face is intense. There comes a point in time where you want some relief, and Peter said, well, Lord, what about him? Hoping that Jesus would turn his eyes to John and we could talk about John for a while instead of any more talking about me. And Jesus said, If I should will that he tarry till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Now, this is, Peter is in here, and all this is in the Bible for us to read and to understand. And all of us can say, Boy, yeah, Peter, yeah, follow, follow God, and, and, and look at it from Peter without realizing that every single one of us is in exactly the same relationship to Jesus Christ that Peter was in. Every single one of us is bound and obligated to him, to follow him. And it isn't any good pointing the finger at somebody else. It isn't any good saying, well, what about him, or, or, or looking in some other direction. The question is, what does he demand of you, not what does he demand of me or some other person. Every Christian must be dedicated. But Jesus bound an obligation upon Peter... That was his and his alone. It was an obligation that he put upon him above any requirement that he had for the sheep. Feed my sheep. He didn't tell the sheep that. He told Peter that. Now, if there was ever a reason to show any appreciation to Peter, it was because he was bound and obligated to the service of those people. It wasn't necessarily because of any greatness of his part. It wasn't because he himself was anything special. It was because Peter was bound and obligated and therefore had no choice in life but to serve in his particular way. Acts 6, I think, describes a really interesting watershed in ministry. Notice I said ministry and not the ministry. 
that ministry is one of the most misunderstood ideas that, that exist in, in, in all Christian theology because of the, the whole idea of clergy and of the class, the, the clergy as a class apart. And so we always think of ourselves as being not ministers as opposed to those who are ministers. But Acts 6, as I said, it, it describes a watershed in ministry. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily administration. And I can see that happening very, very easily, that, that you tend to take care of the people you know. You don't really t you know, have the, the broad view and the realization that I can't just take care of my friends and my acquaintances. Now, it was a, it was a historic obligation among the Jewish people to take care of poor people. And so it was as natural as breathing as they began to cre create a little community for them to think about the poor among them and to make arrangements that widows had food. But as is very much involved in human nature, they tended to think of their own. And because the Jews thought this way and went to work on it, and the Gentile Christians did not particularly think about it this way, the Grecians did not, it wasn't a part of their culture, their widows weren't being taken care of, and the others were. And so you have this split that begins to develop in the church right off the bat. And the apostles, having heard about it and become aware of it, called the multitude of the disciples together to them. They had said, this has got to be dealt with. But they said, it's not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. Now, if you went no further than that, that might be a little bit vague. But the idea is that they had a ministry that involved the Word of God. And there was another ministry that involved taking care of physical needs of people in the church. Neither of them was not, neither of them was out of the ministry, but they were different ministries. Wherefore, brethren, look you out among yourselves seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the Word. For the first time there is created in the church a division of labor that recognizes special gifts, uh, special abilities, special uh, uh, things given by God, special things that people can do, and said it doesn't make out any sense at all for the twelve of us who are the witnesses of Christ's resurrection and who are with Him for all this time and are equipped as we are to teach the Word of God, to take away from that ministry and give it to this other side of the ministry, which is just as needful in many ways and is very important and must be done. So we want seven men to put over this ministry, and we will give ourselves to the ministry of the Word, which is a distinct ministry. But both of them are services. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, Philip, Procurus, and Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And they set them before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. The result of this was that the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and even a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people, not because of his ordination, but because of his faith and power. That's why Philip was in the position that he was to do what he did. And, of course, Philip also got himself killed in the process of that, we're well, using that faith and that power. So comes a watershed, a realization that there are jobs and tasks that fit one person better than they fit another. And it is out of that acknowledgement or that recognition that the responsibility of what we call today the ministry comes into fruition, that there are those who are equipped for the ministry of the Word. There are those who are gifted for leadership. There are those who are able to provide things for the church that the church membership themselves are not able to provide. And so consequently, through the laying on of hands, the setting apart, the dedication of certain individuals, we bind them and we obligate them to the task of the ministry of the Word or another ministry, as the case may be, in those formal types of tasks or responsibilities. Is there a case for ministerial appreciation. Well, down through history, the ministry have served better and the ministry have served worse. 
And there have been times when there has been a, what, what scholars will call a kind of anti-clericalism that will grow up because of abuses that have taken place in the ministry of various and sundry churches from time to time. And almost a, a mood that gets going to, well, who needs a minister? Why should there be a minister? We don't need a minister. We can manage things entirely on our own. And up to a point, I suppose that that is true, that a great deal can be done that way. But I think in many cases that is an overreaction to abuses that have taken place in churches in, in years gone by. And the fact of the matter is that there are those who are singularly equipped to serve you. And it's a shame for the church to deny itself those men because of some anti-ministerial bias because of ministerial abuse of the past. Paul makes an interesting statement to the Thessalonians, and one that I have heard abused in itself, but that also has, is, is really very important. It's in 1 Thessalonians 5, and I'm not going to read very much of it, just verse 12 and 13. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. So there are people to whom he can, he can address this to the brethren, and to the brethren he says there are people who labor among you, and are over you, and admonish you. And somebody really needs to be in a position who, because of perhaps age, experience, spiritual gifts, special dedicate, dedication, is in the position to admonish you. Now, I am not the pastor of this church. I am the speaker here by, by, by courtesy of your board and by, by, by the sufferance of this congregation. And so, should I, on some occasion, decide that I have need to admonish you, I would trust that that would not be rejected because I had no power over you. Because, indeed, I have no power. I have no sanctions. What do I have? What do I have that, that you people should sit here and listen to me, that I should be able to, to use up all these man hours every week by, by standing before you? Why, why should you hear me? if I should, uh, should chastise you verbally somewhere along the line? Well, it has to be because of age, because of experience, because of what you know me to be. Uh, that's the only reason I can think of why it should be so. And if there should come a time when this congregation should need to be admonished, and it's not as though there never has been, because I think there have been two or three admonishments that have come your way from time to time, but as the time comes and, and one has to, has to admonish you, or even to the point, chastise you, it comes from a different kind of a relationship here in this church than it might come in a church where the formal, pastoral, uh, authoritative, and authoritarian relationship existed. For it would have to be out of love, and the response would have to be out of love, because there is no fear. There is no place for that fear, no meaning for that fear. Get to know them who labor among you. I think to know them means basically to recognize, because you obviously know who they are. To recognize them who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. That's one of the things, by the way, I think that enables you to be at peace among yourselves, is when there is someone to provide leadership, some direction, some admonishment, some correction, whom you respect, and whom you will listen to. It helps in the problems of peace or the lack thereof in the church. Now, there are two very important things that I think at times have been overlooked in this statement to the church to esteem those very highly who labor among you in this way. And it is this. Esteem them very highly, one, in love that the relationship is one of love, not one of authority. It's not a question of a bowing down to. It's not a question of holding the door open for or of meeting at the curb and carrying in bags for us or saluting and, and parking the car and all this. It's not that. It is a love. It's an affection that, that exists between us that, that creates that esteem. And the second thing is to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Elders are only entitled to a special esteem if they work. If they don't work, there's no particular reason for special esteem. And the esteem is for their work's sake. What does that mean? It means 
that their work might be improved. That there's something you do for somebody. I have known, for example, of people cutting a minister's grass in years gone by. And I would probably, you know, chase you off my property if you attempt that at my house. But I have known of people doing that at a minister's house before. If they were doing it because he was the minister, it's questionable, highly questionable. If they were doing it because he was up half the night counseling or visiting or driving to visit someone who is sick, it's another thing entirely. That is an act of esteem for his work's sake. You follow me? You understand the difference between the two of them? Because one of them is being a respecter of persons. The other is showing respect and esteem because of the work that has been and is being done. And those things are things which Paul says ought to be done. I think it's very important to make that distinction, and I think it's very important that should you be blessed to have an elder who does that kind of thing, that you show the kind of respect and esteem. And as I said, this church congregation is not guilty of any lack of that uh, in any way, shape, form, or fashion. But this is the day when this sermon has to be given because this is Ministerial Appreciation Day, the first one I know of in all these years. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said something I think very interesting. In 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 14, he said this, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. I don't, I'm not coming down there to be a burden. I seek not yours. I don't want your possessions. I'm not after anything that belongs to you. I want you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Now, in the style of things, and there's a whole sermon, I think, that could be given on that, and maybe someday, God willing, I'll give that one about parents laying up for their children, the economic consequences of this. But in this particular case, I think it's interesting that Paul uses this analogy here for ministers and for members. Now, Jesus made it very plain we're not to call any man on earth our father, and, and we don't want to get into that kind of thing. But nevertheless, the relationship that Paul describes here is not shepherd and sheep, not master and servant, God forbid. It's family, parents, and children. And that's the kind of esteem that we're looking for in this situation. That's the kind of, of, of relationship that should exist if, if, if one exists of this sort between ministers and flock. It is that of family, not authority, not a papal uh, ability to take sanctions against you and hurt you and hurt your income and your life. Not at all. Now, there's one mistake we do not want to make, and I have heard it made again and again and again, and it is a common abuse of the, of, of the use of analogy. The membership, although they are likened to sheep, are not sheep. We confuse so many times. We carry analogies clean outside of their boundaries. The relationship between a minister and his flock, in that sense, or shepherd and sheep, is only an analogy. And any minister who begins to think of the flock as though they were sheep is making a very big mistake and deserves no one's respect. That the relationship that exists between me and you, between the other elders here and you, should be the, re the relationship of family. And that is a very, very different thing. This statement, he said, You are, and this is writing not to the ministry, but to the brethren, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You in time past, and he's basically speaking to Gentiles, were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not obtained mercy. Now you have obtained mercy. And in the process, he called them a holy nation. You know what it means? It means that you are a holy people. That means you are set apart. That means you are dedicated. That means you are bound and obligated to the service of God. Just like I am. Something I don't know if many people have really quite understood. You, and the ministry is called to a special calling and a special dedication. Of that there is no question. 
And each of us has our own unique calling and dedication before God. But you also must be dedicated to God. Paul also wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6.19 and said this, What? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price? Now, allow me to admonish you, if I may. Most of us here go through our lives, living our lives as though our lives were our own. Belongs to me. I can do whatever I jolly well please with it. I'm sorry. No, it doesn't. You have been bought and paid for. You're the bondservant of Jesus Christ. You are bound. You are dedicated. You don't have the choices that you otherwise might have in the world. And if you're going to be a servant of God, it's time you realize that. Someone should have explained that to you before you were baptized. Somebody might very well have sat down with Luke 14 and said, You better count the cost, because what you are going into here is going to cost you everything. And so, don't look at me and say, Well, Ron, is, he is, he's bound and obligated to the service of God's people. Ah, so are you. Just in different ways, in different times, different circumstances. You are bound and obligated to his service. And since service means ministry, you also have a ministerial obligation, every single one of you. Paul elsewhere writes to the Ephesians, in chapter 4, verse 7. And he says this, To every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Every one of us, you have been given grace. He then says, when he ascends up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it that he first descended also into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same as the one that went up. In other words, Paul is making very great emphasis on the fact that Jesus came down and he returned to the Father. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some shepherds and some teachers. Why did he do this? Well, he did it for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, the work of service to the people of God, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, the word edifying is a, is a word that we don't use a lot in our language, I'm afraid, and consequently it may not ring or register as well as it could. It basically means to build, or to educate and to build, the idea of to build up. For the building up of the body of Christ. We'd like your church to get bigger. We'd like for it to be built. There are two ways. One is it gets built in terms of the quality of your knowledge of God, your education. It also gets built in terms of becoming larger. And because it becomes larger, why should a church become larger? For service. There's no other reason. Unless the church has work to do, there is no reason for it to get any bigger. If all it's going to do is just get together and fellowship and sing songs, praise God, and, and learn don't need to be any bigger. The only reason it needs to get bigger is because there is work to do. Okay, so he gave this to the, to, the, to the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith. And it's going to come about not as a result of, of some authoritative structure of the church. It's going to come about because we have been edified, that we have been taught, we have come to, this, to the unity of the faith. That's how the unity comes about. The knowledge of the Son of God to the perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we be henceforth no more children. And we got a ways to go to be no more children. Tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, and they are everywhere. Everywhere. And people go neighing off after them, and it's unbelievable sometimes what people will chase in terms of ideas that people may present. Why do they do it? Well, it's because they do not know their Bibles very well, candidly. And I find that an awful lot of people who think they know their Bibles fairly well really know it only in a very narrow perspective. They have learned it according to one way of looking at it, and they can't break loose from that one way of looking at it. And consequently, someone comes along and challenges effectively that narrow perspective, and their faith is just gone. Because, for example, some people look at the inspiration of the Bible and the canonization of Scripture in a certain way. Someone comes along and challenges that in such a way that they can't answer it, and their faith is gone. 
one wonders, you know, what happens to people? Why are we so weak? Why are we so, so easily manipulated? But, he said, what we should do is not be in that situation of being blown around by doctrine and by the craftiness of men. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him, unto him in all things who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined, joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. Now, I've, I've read this a hundred times, and every time I come to it, I come to the same conclusion, that the edifying of the church, the building of the church, the growth and development of the church is done by what every joint, every finger, every fingernail that's in this room, what every one of us supply. It's not done by the work of the ministers as such. In a lot of ways, I think the biggest mistake that's ever been made in churches in our tradition is assuming that it was the ministry that did the work. The truth is, it is the ministry that prepare the man of God and equip all of you to every good work. For that's where the work is done, is by you. My job is not to do your work for you, but to teach and to train you to do your work, to exhort you to do your work, to shame you, if necessary, for not doing your work, to act in a lot of ways like Dad in the family who has to grab somebody by the scruff of the neck every once in a while and say, you will mow the grass, son. But it's that kind of a relationship that should exist in the church, not one of somebody being able to punish you or, or, or sanction you or in some way harm you. That's not what we're all about. But I will tell you this, the work, whatever the work is of this church, you all here will either do it or it will not be done. For I have my work that God has commissioned me to do personally. I have my gifts that he has given me to use personally, and part of those is to sort of beat up on you guys today. But my work is not your work, and your work is not mine. Each of us has our task before God. Each of us is a dedicated line for one purpose, that one purpose only. We need to be after it. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by what every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, makes increase of the body unto the, and listen to this, the edifying of itself. It is not that something acts on the church. The church edifies itself. How does it do that? By that which every joint supplies. Us elders are among the more experienced, perhaps gifted in certain ways, and we are, and to use the French phrase, agent provocateur. We're provocative agents placed among the church to move you, to stir you, to encourage you, to shame you occasionally, to give you a little verbal chastisement once in a while to gently teach you the right ways, to give you the skills you need to do the things you need to do. That's our job. And God, with God's help, we will continue to do it. And while I may occasionally may sound like I might chastise this church, I appreciate this church, I think, every bit as much as you folks appreciate us. And we, we appreciate you very much for what you have been, had the courage to do to step out and to form a new church. And what you are now continuing to have the courage to do, that's look for ways to grow, to develop, and to spread, even though you really, in some cases, don't know how to do what you are trying to do. You want to, and you're trying to learn, and you're going to get the job done, I believe. When I consider what has been accomplished in the past with only the ministry really working in any way at, at, at increasing the body, I really wonder what might have been accomplished and what might be accomplished now. If every part of it, every member, were dedicated to the task. If everyone were bound and obligated to the ministry of Jesus Christ. We'll see.